So we are uh, in our fourth uh, lesson in a series called This Is It. And uh, it's all about trying to understand the impact of the kingdom of God when it came. Uh, they'd waited for it a long time. Uh, Israel was waiting for it. They didn't really understand what was coming. But when it came, after the disciples were you know, filled with the Holy Spirit and after they began to preach, it was like, this is it. This is what came. Well, what is it? What, what was that? What's the, what was the kingdom all about? So we've talked about uh, the fact that everyone was welcome. In a society that was splintered up into cliques, sometimes like ours, sometimes even some of our churches, uh, Jesus came and welcomed everybody. In fact, that would be the basis of his clique. Everybody was welcome who recognized that he was the Son of God um, and the Messiah. And so everyone was welcome. That's, that was different. That was new. And then, and then the, the, uh, the kingdom of God was full of people who would be one. That God's intention was that they would be one in, in purpose, in unity, in love, one family. And through that unity, the world could see that God had truly been here in Jesus Christ. That's what he prayed in John 17. And so that we are one. And then last week we talked about we are changed. And I, made, I, I want to point out that, that we weren't talking about what we changed, right? If you were here. It wasn't just about what we changed. We might be able to talk about a lot of things that we changed since we became a Christian. I can. Can you? Things we changed. But that's not what we were talking about last week. Last week we were, talk we were talking about we are changed. And we looked at passages of Scripture that show us that those who truly receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the love of God are changed by it and become Loving and merciful and gracious and, and forgiving. We're changed by that. And so this week, we're talking about we are committed. We're committed. And uh, there's a, a way of speaking about committed right now, a popular way of speaking about. Uh, somebody will say, I'm all in. Have you heard that? I'm all in. He's all in, right? Where does that come from? Yeah, it's... It, comes from, you know, the, the rise in popularity of Texas Hold'em, right? Texas Hold'em. And, um, and the thing about Texas Hold'em is, different than other, other sort of games of poker is, at, at any point, you know, in, in the game, on your turn, you can move all in. You can just put all your chips and the whole tournament at stake on this hand, on these two cards, you can go all in. And so that's fully committing your, your tournament life, fully committing all your chips. You're all in. And it's interesting that sometimes when a person goes all in, and, and real amateurs won't do this, but sometimes when a person goes all in in Texas Hold'em, uh, they'll do so even with the worst possible hand. Anybody know what that is? The worst possible hand in, in Texas Hold'em is a 7-2 offsuit. It's just the worst possible hand you can start with. Okay. And there are times when, when a person, a professional, or someone who knows what they're doing, will go all in. It doesn't make any sense to some people. The, the guy might not want to do it, or the girl might not want to do it, but they still do it. Why? Because they understand the math. They believe in the power of the math in Texas Hold'em. And they just know if you get below a certain amount of chips in a tournament play, under 10 big blinds, they call it. You can go figure out what that is, but... But if you do, you're pretty much sunk. And so at that point, you've either got to double up or you're going to lose a tournament. And sometimes they do. But overall, they know if they trust the math, even with the worst hand, when they don't want to do it, they, if they trust the math, they'll win more than they'll lose. They'll win more tournaments than they'll lose. Trusting the math. Now, why did I tell you all that? Because it's interesting to me, probably the best example of, of being committed and going all in is, of course, Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus, uh, Paul describes in, in Philippians, it, it looks like an early Christian hymn, but he describes as Jesus who had everything. He, he, he was so high, he had no upward mobility. Right? It, there was nowhere else to go up. He had it all. And he left it all. Not only to become human, but, but he left it all to even, even become a slave, a servant, and even die. And not just any death, but death on a cross. The greatest humiliation, he left everything. He went all in. And we know that most people did not understand what he was saying or what he was doing, at least at first. His disciples were like, no, you're nuts. That's not going to happen. 
Didn't understand it. Didn't make any sense. But he was all in. And even Jesus in the garden didn't want to do it. Didn't want to play that hand. Right? Am I right about that? He, God, Father, let it pass for me. I don't want to do this. Who would? But he was all in. Not because he trusted the math. Right here it would be great if I had a lisp. He trusted the master. Get it? Not the math, but the master, right? <laughs> it, great alliteration right there if I had a lisp. Um, but it's not, he trusted the one who knew, you know, what, how, what works, what's going to work, the best plan. And so he was all in. Didn't make any sense to most people, and he didn't want to do it, but he was all in. That's commitment. And that's the kind of commitment I want to talk about today. And, and there were others we could talk about in the New Testament who actually went all in in the same way that gave up their lives. You know, Stephen sat, you know, preached to the people who killed Jesus. Doesn't seem like a smart move, but he was all in. And they killed him for it. They stoned him. And he was so all in that we hear him praying just as Jesus prayed, Father, forgive him. Right? He was all in. Doesn't make sense. Who wants to do that? But he did. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, who was there giving his authority to, to do this, to kill Stephen. But, but in his life, he had to suffer like five times. He received a 40 lashes minus one, and he was beaten with rods, and, and he shipwrecked and bit by snakes, and, and finally seems beheaded in Rome. And he went all through that. He was all in. He knew he was on his way to death, but he was all in. Uh, so we can talk about that. Uh, you and I, in this country, in this situation, we are not like some people in the world, we are not at that point where our lives are on the line, where, where all in means, okay, take my life. It could happen. It could happen. But, but right now, in our context, we're not so much in that situation. So what does it look like for, like, not in the I'm laying my life down situation, but what does it look like in the context of maybe more sort of safety? What does it look like to go all in? Right? That's what, that's what I want to talk about. Now, it may be that it's important to know what it looks like to go all in, before we ever get into that situation where we have to actually give up our lives. Wouldn't it be nice to be prepared for that? By knowing what it is to go all in as a believer, as a Christian, uh, in everyday life? Doesn't that seem like it might help if that other day ever comes? I think so. So uh, I want to talk about stories of commitment, but first I want to remind you of this in Romans. For whatever was written in former days... So all of the Old Testament, all of the, the, the stories of, of the acts of God through history, they were written for who or for whom? Yeah, so just understand that. There's stories in here, those, 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 those who walked with God, the normal everyday Joes who walked with God, those stories are for you and I. Those stories are for you and me. Man, those things are hard to tell. <laughs> those stories are for you and me. They're there for us to understand what it is to walk with God every day and to trust God. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when nobody understands it, even when we don't want to. That's what those stories are there for. And so I want to look at a few of those stories. First, I want to talk about Noah. Just briefly, I would just want to look at Noah's story. Noah was all in. Okay, how do I know that? Well... He spent a hundred years, it looks like, building an ark. A hundred years. Mary Pearson. I think she's like 96 or 97 years old. Anybody know? Is it 96? No, no, it's not 95. I, 95? I thought she had her 96th birthday. Okay, she's 95. Close enough. <laughs> sorry, I, I made it seem like you're older. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, Mary's 95, okay? Imagine every day of every year of Mary's life working on one thing. Right? That's a long time. You've been around for a while, Mary? You have, haven't you? Praise God. I hope you're around for another 50 years. Well, you've been around for a while too, Annabelle. You're just a young spring chicken. Every day of Annabelle's life, plus eight, working on the same thing over and over. I mean, that's all in there. Now, you know what? If you look up Noah building the ark, you'll get a picture like this. Isn't that nice? It's a family affair. Let me tell you something. 
Almost all the pictures look like this. I challenge you to find that in the Bible. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I can't say that for sure. But I can say this. The Bible never says it happened that way. I'm just saying. The Bible never tells us that his family helped build the ark. Never says that. If it does, show me. I mean, maybe it does. Maybe I missed it. I've looked. It basically says Noah was told to build an ark. And it says Noah built an ark. And in fact, there's one passage where Noah talks about opening the window of the ark that he had made. Not that his family made. Not that his family helped with. Not that they had made. That he had made. I'm not saying maybe he didn't have. I'm not doing the maybe thing. I'm just saying all we know for sure is Noah built an ark. So for 100 years here he's built an ark. I don't know if his family was with him. Maybe they thought he was nuts. I think everybody else probably thought he was nuts. What kind of house is that? And why is he building this so big? And who would want to live in that thing? Right? For 100 years, people are thinking he's nuts. And I wonder how many times even Noah himself thought, am I nuts? <laughs> Wouldn't you? Or what about this? Maybe you've thought of this. What if I get all the way down the road? I've been doing this for a year. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 50 years. And what if I get all the way down the road and nothing happens? God's told me to do this and I've done it for a hundred years and then nothing happens. Not only am I a laughing stock, but now there's a monument to my foolishness for the rest of my life. <laughs> Every day, people are going to be walking by. Ha <laughs> ha. Guess who that was? You heard of Noah? Yeah, that's him. Probably after he dies, he'll still be there. And they'll put up signs and come take the tour about Noah. You ever think that way? You think, well, uh, you know, you start to question and wonder. And so Noah was all in. I think we can learn something from Noah. Even when everyone around us sees things differently or even thinks we're a little nuts, keep building your ark. Just keep building your ark. Walk with God. Trust God. Trust, the, not the math, <laughs> trust the master. Trust the one who knows. You know what, Noah? won that tournament. He did. God kept his promises. God was faithful. Unfortunately, the rains came. Noah built the ark, saved his family. Build your ark. Walk with God. Trust God. And build your ark. Another guy, Abraham. Abraham was all in. This guy was already old when God called him. He was 75. Say, so, oh yeah, but they lived a lot longer back then. He only, I, don't, I think it's 120 or so. He didn't live that much longer. This was the other side of his life. It was the last half. He was already old when God said, hey, I, I want you to leave the safety and security of the numbers, and I want you to branch out on your own with just your family, and I want you to go to a place where everybody's probably going to want to kill you. I mean, he didn't put it in those words, but that's the word. That's, that was life. There was, there was no great peace. There was no great safety. The only safety was really in numbers. And so here he is, he's already an older guy, but he goes all in. Maybe because, well, he has no children and his name's going to die out and that's the worst thing that could happen, so he doesn't want that to happen. And, and so he puts his faith in God and he says, well, if I'm going to have an heir, God says I will and it's the only way I'm going to do it, so I'm going to follow God. And we know his following God looked like this. We know it wasn't perfect, but he went all in. And it's like, okay, God, uh, you promised me I'd have not only children, but like the sands of the sea or like the stars in the sky. Okay, I'm going to go all in. And he does. But after a while, he's like, you know, I'm getting kind of old here. And so uh, in Genesis, uh, well, this is what God promised him. I'm going to make you a great nation. But after a while, so here's Genesis 15. Abraham said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me for I continue what? Why did I leave in the first place? Why did I even trust you? What did you promise? You promised there would be Children, you promised I wouldn't die without an heir, and yet I have no heir. Behold, you've given me no offspring, and now a member of my household will be my heir, like a servant will become my heir. So God, you're failing me. I've been waiting. Where's the promise? Abraham had to wait 25 years. He was already old when God called him. He had to wait, and through those years until he was 100 years old, he had to watch 
as the possibility, which was already far gone, the possibility of having children came and went completely. I think it's the Hebrew writer that says that when Abraham and Sarah's bodies were past the years of having children, they were dead as far as having children is concerned. Now, if you're Abraham, what are you thinking as you're waiting for God? While your bodies are still possibly able to have children, you're thinking, okay, God, the time's getting short. But what happens when you pass those years of possibility? Now, how do you keep going? It doesn't make any sense. I don't want to be on this journey, God. But Abraham was all in. And when it was no longer possible, that's when God can show up. That's when God will do something, and, and you can't deny it's God when Isaac is born a miracle child. You can't deny it. Because it has to be God, because it can't be them. She's 90 and he's 100, and everybody knows that they weren't going to be able to have children. And so God shows up. And so lesson for Abraham, no matter how long it takes, keep trusting God will keep his promises. Even if those voice, voices whisper in your head, it doesn't make any sense. This doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm, now it's impossible. It's not impossible for God. God keeps his promises. He'll show up. And we, we're supposed to learn from these stories. Ab Abraham went all in, and he won that tournament. He won that tournament. And even after he got his child, and this is looked at as the greatest act of faith ever, now he's, I think Abraham's probably like 114 years old or so. I think, I think Isaac's probably somewhere in his teens. I'm not sure. But God says, okay, now I want you to kill him. <laughs> what? You think Abraham wanted to do that? You think that made sense to anybody? But the Hebrew writer tells us he had a reason that you know, God who can do anything can even bring back my child from the dead if he has to. But I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to keep his promises. I'm just all in. That's Abraham. We need to go all in. We can go all in. It may not make any sense. We may not like the cards we're playing. But you can still go all in. God's faithful. He'll keep his promises. Last story. I know you probably knew the story of Noah and Abraham. I don't know if you know the story of Jonathan. Anybody know the story of Jonathan? Some of you do, and I'm not talking about the arrows and David. You know that story? David go out, Jonathan run out further, right? Or David run out further, and I'll, I'll tell you if Saul wants to kill you. I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about the story of, da of Jonathan, and anybody can guess which story I'm talking about? Who? No, no. His armor bearer. Anybody know that story? Jonathan and his armor bearer. These guys are nuts. Let me just say that right off the bat. Okay, they're not nuts. But my goodness, this guy goes all in. It's like a Davidic moment, uh, like David and Goliath thing. Uh, the scene is, you've got uh, King Saul uh, uh, camped with 600-something uh, men. He's, he's camped, and he's, he's, he's kind of butted up against a garrison of, of Philistines, and they're, they're going to go at it soon. They're, they're probably just planning how they're going to do it. They're waiting for someone to make the first move. I don't know. But there's a Philistine outpost, a military outpost, and they're all ready. And one morning, like anybody would do, Jonathan wakes up and says to his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or few. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, hey, let's go over to that Philistine garrison and just start knocking them out in the name of the Lord. And he does. He goes over there, and, and he's at a lower spot, and, and they're kind of up above, above a rocky crag, it says. And, and if he's going to go up there, he's going to have to climb up this rocky crag to get there. He says, hey, let's go over there, and if they see us and call out this one thing, then, then we'll know we ought to wait here. But if they say this other thing come up, we'll go up there, and then we'll know God's given us, given them into our hand. And there's only two of them. And they get there, and there's like, there's more than 20 men up there. I know that, because... Because when the Philistines say those words, Jonathan's like, hey, they're all ours. Let's go. And they climb up this rocky crag, and they just start wiping out the enemies of God. And, and, and the camp gets so stirred up that, that the Philistines are woken up with this fear that, oh, no, what's happening? We're being attacked. And they start going crazy and even hitting each other and killing each other with swords. And, and it gets all this big tumult. And Saul's camp hears about it. And Saul's like, what's happening over there? Did, did we send a band over there to attack? I mean, how many did we send? So they count all of their people, 
and they find out there's two missing. That whole thing, there's two missing. But it wasn't just two involved, was it? Jonathan didn't think it was. There was Jonathan, and there was his armor bearer, and there was God. And Jonathan was like, if God is for us, who can be against us? But you know what else is amazing? His armor bearer. His armor bearer says, I mean, who, you know what? If I'm the armor bearer and, and, and my, uh, my lord or who, my, you know, whoever he is, my, my guy, my, my warrior, he says to me, hey, I got an idea. Let's go attack the garrison of Philistines, right? Before he turns around to see my reaction, there's going to be a pile of armor. That's all he'll see, <laughs> because it doesn't make sense to me. I, but his armor bearer says, do all that's in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. Isn't that amazing? Not only was Jonathan all in, his armor bearer was all in. Here's something we can learn from Jonathan. When God provides an opportunity, be bold. Trust that God is on your side. Listen, I'm not saying go out and beat people up with your Bible that don't want to hear it. Uh, maybe the soil's not prepared there. I, I, I don't think it's, it's valuable just to, to go up and dump all your seed on the path. Okay? While you're casting it, some may go up there, that's fine. But to go attack the path and think you're going to do any good, I don't think so. But if God has truly given you an opportunity, if there's somebody who's hurting and in need of help and have no hope, and, and you've got good news... And you've, you've got a source of peace and forgiveness and, and, and mercy and healing and power. Say something. Don't worry that, well, maybe, they'll, maybe they, they, they won't like if me if I say it. Maybe they won't like what I say. Maybe they'll argue with me. Forget about all that. Trust that God is on your side. Trust that he provides an open door. And let somebody know about Jesus. Does that make sense? I mean, my goodness, Jonathan... And his armor bearer are willing to, to go up there and get slaughtered with a sword for the sake of God's kingdom. And now we're being called to, to push all in, to trust God and push all in. The last group I want to give you is, so the early disciples, right away when they were saved, all of them didn't, here, let me look over here for one second. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to just run through this real quick. These guys immediately, uh, even though the Sanhedrin may be, have been a threat, they didn't immediately like, be facing the cross themselves. They didn't immediately be facing death themselves. But, but they, were, they were committed. They were committed, and the text says what they were committed to. They devote, isn't it the same thing if I say they devoted themselves to? Doesn't that sound like all in? They're devoted to. They've committed themselves to what? To the apostles' teaching. Now, Right then, that wasn't like, you know, everything like, uh, what did the Corinthians mean about baptism for the dead? Uh, apostles' teaching right here in this context specifically had to do with, what do you think? The gospel, right? And, and it would be from the Old Testament as well. But it would be the, the Old Testament telling the story of what God did in and through Jesus Christ and was continuing to do. The apostles' doctrine that they were focused on is this is what's happening. This is it. And so we can learn from that. We need to spend time in the Word of God with a specific focus on this is what God is doing in and through Jesus Christ. And you are the body of Christ. So he's doing it through you. Secondly, it says they not only devote themselves to the apostles' doc, uh, teaching, but also to the fellowship. It doesn't just mean hanging out here. This word koinonia has to do with uh, an idea that says you and I are one in Christ because of what Jesus did. And to devote myself to the fellowship is, is, is me devoting myself to you. And for you to devote yourself to me, that we are devoted to each other. And so we can learn from this, spend time with the people of God. Um, there, there are people spending time with the people of God uh, yesterday morning. Didn't we have a DDOG group here doing their... Did we have a work day here? The D-Dog group was here working, building stuff, fixing stuff. Uh, yeah, they were spending time devoted to the people of God and to this resource, and that's amazing, right? Uh, spend time with the people of God. Friday night, so Friday night there was a group here. We were here for our Who Let Them In group, and also celebrating Matt Hirschwater's birthday, and that was all fun, and we, we played some games, and we were devoted to each other in that. 
Thursday night, some people were here devoted to watching the movies every third Sunday, the Christian movies. We watched In His Steps. Uh, great book. Movie's a little cheesy. <laughs> but it was a, you know, kind of a lower production. But still, the book was amazing, and still the message is amazing. Be committed, right? All in. Uh, what would Jesus do? That's where it comes from. Uh, that's, uh, so Thursday night. Wednesday night, our Unite group, passionate kids here and adults here, devoted to one another. Um, just uh, Friday week, how do you say that? Friday ago week, something like that. Anyway, I would say uh, not this past Friday, but the one before it. That's a lot of words. But we had that Maker Fest. People devoted to the fellowship, devoted to one another, doing amazing things in here. This place was filled with, with kids, parents, and servants in the name of Jesus right in here. It was awesome. These things are going on. Devoted to each other. We need to do that. They devote themselves to the breaking of bread. And when we talk about the breaking of bread, people like to somehow distinguish between, well, this was a common meal and this was the Lord's Supper. And, you know, the text doesn't really do that. Breaking bread is breaking bread. And when the disciples met together, they actually had a meal. It was instituted during a meal. And they had a meal together. And the meal, during the meal together, they recognized what Jesus had done for them and that they were the body of Christ because of it. Anytime they did that, it was the Lord's Supper. It was. It was a meal, and it was in honor of what Jesus had done. Uh, we've kind of narrowed it down, but we do that every Sunday. Every Sunday, we have a time together where we focus on what Jesus did, what the bread means, and what the cup means. And so a lesson would be, spend time doing that. <laughs> spend time with the people of God focusing on Jesus. And besides our communion service, we have our growth groups. And our growth groups are specifically designed for us to spend time with the people of God focusing on Jesus. So get involved in the growth groups. We're going to be starting a new setup after the holiday, after Christmas. We're going to need growth group leaders for that. We'll need homes. We'll need hosts. So please get involved in that. It's important. We need to, we need to be devoted to that, all in, committed. And last one, and to the prayers. And this isn't just talking about prayer, but here the prayers meant the daily prayers. They were going to the temple, still going to the temple and the daily prayers. They were devoted to them. But for us... Not only should we be involved in, in individually spending time with God in prayer, but, but we need to be in prayer with, with each other as well. And Wednesday night, uh, the Foresters have a prayer group back here you can join and be part of. We've seen a lot of healing through that. Uh, you can make use of that. So, so this church is involved in these ways, but these are the kinds of things we need to be devoted to. If you're not devoted to them, this is how the early church went all in. And I believe if we go all in and trust God, in this way, in these ways, that ultimately, um, if that day comes where we need to go all in like the martyrs did, uh, we'll be prepared. Okay? We're going to sing a song. Kent's going to come up and, and lead us. If you have any cards you can, left, you can turn them into the center. And uh, be, be, please stand up right now as we sing this song. <laughs>